Uh, Mishan, thank you so much. And uh, you know, hello to all uh, our fellows, colleagues, some names I've recognized uh, uh, from around the world. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time. And uh, it's a kind of a rare honor and a privilege for me to present to all of you. And this content is intentionally sort of oriented toward an EP audience. Uh, then of course, you know, anyone who's also in other areas of cardiology, hopefully, and enjoy it. So uh, going on to my first slide. So this is our mission statement of our group. And I put up this slide in almost every talk that I give. This is a requirement of the presentation over here where we have to uh, talk about our disclosures. And uh, the disclosure is here in the bottom part of the slide. But I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all my colleagues on this slide, which uh, I mean, they are the very best people. And I actually miss not physically seeing them, every one of them every day. Uh, we are now having a skeletal crew because of the COVID crisis. This also recognizes all the funding agencies we've had over the years. Uh, and it's, uh, it's only you know, donor and public money that led to the research. The two aspects, the bookends of this slide in the left upper corner you see is a McAlpine image of the human heart. We're gonna hear a lot about this in this lecture and a, a floro image of a procedure and at the right part of the screen, you actually see a confocal image, uh, which is a light sheet microscopic image of cardiac nerves. It really sort of bookends the two aspects of our work, which is um, we do complex interventions and we do science all the way to the basic level. And these are the men and women, the team that does the work. And uh, um, I have the privilege to present some of their work. So we love cardiac interventions. Uh, and uh, you're going to see a huge amount of work that um, we are hoping to present to you where it is, uh, we view anatomy as macro structure function. So every time you place a catheter in the heart, you're getting an information that is recorded through any modality, electrical, imaging. Uh, you're really in your mind, you're putting this in the context of three-dimensional anatomy over here. And of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, the purpose of this series of lectures that we have created, and depending on how this goes, we'll try to give the entire sequence online uh, for the benefit of trainees and also be very honest about feedback. Um, I'm old enough to have very thick skin about uh, things that work, things that don't work. Uh, and we uh, at UCLA, we are very big fans. And as all my colleagues are around the world in EP, uh, science and education is what links all of us. And uh, uh, much like a virus that knows no borders, knowledge should not have any borders and science should not have any borders. So uh, here is a, um, you know, the overall mission statement of these lecture series. And our aim is to actually place a cardiac anatomy in its proper anatomical orientation of the human body. And of course, this will also be hopefully an inspiration for future areas where there is a knowledge gap and where we want to do science. So um, there are a whole lot of concepts that are going to be presented, but it's uh, my hope today is to give you orientation of the human heart, a little bit of orientation of the heart on fluoroscopy. I'll introduce you to what we mean by the term attitudinal terms. And then of course, we'll start with the outside of the heart and later do uh, cardiac chambers, conduction system, and advanced anatomy. So um, there's nothing at UCLA that starts uh, off or ends without a citation to John Wooden, who is our legendary coach. And you can see in my virtual background, I always have a picture of John Wooden because he's the coach who keeps us, uh, you know, our feet firmly on the ground. Uh, for some of the people, you know, when I grew up in India, we would say it's like the Upanishads, which is a philosophical work. But at UCLA, I would say that this man's teaching is right up there with the absolute best in what we aspire for. So one of John Wooden's famous statement was, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And he also said, failure is not fatal, but failure to change may be. And the reason why I put this at the beginning of an anatomy lecture is because anatomy is not gonna change. So any time you devote to it and get really good at it, it's a great investment in your career and for our patients, because every single patient that is being treated by any one of you belongs to all of us. 
And really that's how we have to view medicine. And, and in fact, all of us do. So um, uh, to put it in a uh, much more day-to-day -day, uh, sort of format, and I'll give you all these rules applying in future talks, but I'll give you three rules applying. One is we have to think about uh, EP like how pilots do, which is takeoffs are optional, landings are mandatory. So don't start a procedure if you do not know how to handle it and safely finish the procedure for the patient. And 90% of EP procedures are elective. Therefore, there is no excuse to take on the procedure without being well prepared. And again, never let a catheter or an instrument take you somewhere where your mind did not get to five minutes earlier. That's true. And the pilots use a nice term for this. They say, never get behind the plane, be in front of the plane, ahead of it. And always have a pre-procedure, pre-flight, inter-procedure checklist and a post-procedure checklist. The most important pre-procedure checklist is to know the anatomy of what you're gonna be doing today. So uh, all our talks start with a little a tip of the hat with history. For many of you may know this, this is the famous, uh, uh, a mural that hangs in the Institute of Cardiology in Mexico City, painted by Diego Rivera. And in this mural, maybe some of the colleagues from Mexico can uh, comment on this. Uh, so uh, one of the, there are many famous anatomists in that painting and we'll talk about this. And uh, we would always say that this, uh, one of the famous uh, physiologists uh, in the history of medicine is of course is Michael Servetus. And uh, we often say, and he actually had a very tough ending as uh, fans of history would know. So we always say that cardiac anatomy was a dangerous business in the middle ages. Fortunately, it is not so now. Most of what we do in anatomy, uh, at least as interventionists, starts off in our world by having limited access to the heart or we image it using some imaging modality. And of course, the modality that is still uh, used and it's never going to go out of style in the foreseeable future uh, is actually uh, a fluoroscopy. And in fact, fluoroscopy is how we actually were able to relate uh, form to function. So uh, Rengen's work, again, immortalized in Rivera's mural over here, is how we look at the heart. The other aspect of the heart, the other distinct you know, bookend, if you will, is complete access to the heart, which is what surgeons have. And one of the surgeons, you know, uh, is McAlpine, who created this uh, phenomenal atlas uh, in uh, the late 60s, early 70s. There was only one edition of that atlas. And after a multi-year search, we were able to locate the McAlpine's collection. And it's now been digitized, and now we are in the process of sharing it widely to the world. And these slides that Dr. McAlpine had were created by mounting hearts and he did this in a he set up an entire anatomical studio and he would actually pressure perfuse human hearts and he would film them from a distance and since he pressure perfused them uh they were not collapsed so in other words you would actually see the specimens as if it were functioning working heart and these are images that i got from the mcalpine family and this a uh, lot of these images you see over here are images that are taken from a distance and things that you can instantly relate to when you do an electroanatomic map or a proscopic image of the heart. So, um, so how does uh, McAlp why is McAlpine, word? why am I spending a few minutes on this? Because you will hopefully agree with this comment that was made in his obituary and that is, um, it is an original work that may be equal but will be difficult to surpass. And of course, this book is no ordinary atlas, it's a work of art. And all of us at UCLA feel that. So first off, how does the heart sit in the chest? How is it oriented? Here are two images uh, and this, uh, one is a CT image and one is a gross anatomic image. And this is to emphasize something which all of us know, the heart is actually a mediastinal structure and, and it's tilted slightly to the left. And it's almost, if you're looking from the foot end of the patient, the heart is slightly clockwise rotated compared to mammals that walk on four feet, for instance. So that is the, uh, the first important aspect of the human heart. And so all that is right is actually in the front and all that has the term left in general is behind, is posterior. Now, 
the terms, the attitudinal terms become very important in how we describe anatomy. And it's best to describe anatomy of the heart based on how the heart sits in the chest. So that has led to a huge amount of confusion in our field. And it's worth remembering the long axis of the heart and the long axis of the body are at two different levels. And that is a very important description. And that has led to a lot of avoidable, unnecessary confusion in our field. So any uh, uh, terminology that I use, and occasionally people please correct me if I uh, make incorrect comments because it's still hard to get rid of some of these wrong, bad terms, but we'll always use attitudinal terms. Uh, here are two slides which I've kept going for the past um, you know, uh, several years. This comes from a very dear friend, Mark Wood, who is Dr. Ellen Bogan's colleague. He passed away many years ago because of cancer. And I keep this slide in my collection. I show this to all the electrophysiologists in the world, uh, just to, in a way, thank him. And he was one of the kindest and most gentle souls. So Mark Wood, in his lecture and in his honor, I'm showing these two slides. And that is attitudinal nomenclature. So superior is toward the hand, inferior is toward the feet. Anterior is toward the sternum, posterior is toward the spine. We don't prefer using that term. It's better to say superior, inferior. So the anterior, posterior is a term that is to be avoided because it is meaningful in the context of the chest wall and the whole body. But when the term anterior and posterior are used for the heart, that leads to a lot of confusion, okay? Medial is toward midline, lateral is away from midline. All right, so keep that in mind. And so let's jump into what is attitudinal views of the heart. Attitudinal views of the heart are RAO and LAO, and which all of us in EP instantly know because we are, we constantly do this every day when we go into the lab. So here's a McAlpine image. And on the right panel, I've actually given you a still shot from a uh, epicardial ablation procedure where we injected a tiny bit of contrast into the pericardial space. And if I now overlay the line diagrams of the border forming structures in these two views, you can instantly see that the contrast pretty much covers the heart and it outlines all the key structures. So if you look at RAO in this little bay over here, which is uh, a region where you'll see the tip of the left atrial appendage, so you'll see that this is LV, which is border forming over here. And then the inferior surface of the heart is actually what is border forming is the right ventricle. And uh, then of course, you can see a little bit of a tiny shadow over there near the IVC. And then the contrast goes around the great vessels over here. And in an epicardial case, if you put a tiny bit of contrast, you'll actually see the right atrial appendage. The RAO is a very important view because this is the view and again, what angle you should pick, it depends on how the heart sits in the chest of that patient. And what is on the left aspect of the screen is atrial. What is on the right aspect of the screen is, vent screen is ventricular. And in this case, it's a standard EP setup. All of you instantly know that this is a uh, CS catheter from the IJ, a his catheter, RV. There's a high right atrial catheter. And in this case, there's also a catheter from the IVC that is entered into the CS. So that is to give you RAO orientation. And in the RAO view, if I now inject contrast using a pigtail into the aortic root, and in this case, just to keep the screen less crowded, you, know, you have a much thinner CS catheter here, the CS, uh, His catheter and HRA catheter. And what you see over here is the pigtail is sitting in the non-coronary cusp, which is of course, related to the interatrial septum, right? All of you see it on TEE, you recognize it. And you can use this as a marker for where the membranous septum is. And we're going to be talking a lot about that in the future when we talk about the conduction system. The next view, the orthogonal view of the heart is the LAO view, which is shown over here. And in LAO, uh, again, contrast in the pericardial space, this patient has a atrial lead ICD and all that good stuff. This view is a very important view because this helps us distinguish what is right from left. So this is in the plane of the ventricular septum and the atrial septum in general. And in this case, you can see the CS uh, catheter from the IJ goes all the way almost, you know, not quite close, but um, you know, it's already entered the great cardiac vein. And you can see there's in this 
patient, the patient actually had a stent uh, in the LAD, which you can see as a faint shadow over here. But the LAO view opens up the, literally the two, the tricuspid and the mitral annually look like, uh, uh, you know, the two eyeballs, you know, two eye sockets looking at you. So that is the clock face view of the AB valves. And another easy term to use is use this as a clock face and say where accessory pathways are. And it's better to say anything that is in the upper part of the screen as superior and anything in the lower part of the screen as inferior. What is toward the midline is, uh, you know, is, is medial and what goes toward the borders of the heart is lateral, right? So if you keep that as your terminologies, you're gonna be very clear when you communicate between teams as to what you're looking at. So lose, don't use the words anterior uh, and posterior. That is very, very misleading. And um, it's, it's an anachronism and really strongly should be avoided. So this is LAO view in this case. Again, I'm injecting a tiny bit of contrast into the aorta, in the exact same position. We'll talk more about this in a future lecture. Dr. Bradfield is going to talk to you about the, uh, you know, the sinuses and mapping VT and so forth. But I want, I'd be grateful if all of you can use this as a sort of a, a road map for you to look at where uh, the, how the aortic root sits and how the His bundle in the conduction system is the absolute center of the uh, mammalian heart. So that's where the conduction system, you know, penetrates from the atria to the ventricle. And in many ways, you can sort of use that as a, as a sort of a pivotal point around which you can sort of look at how the heart is constructed. I'll repeat some of these concepts in future talks so that you'll have a good orientation. This view is, is gonna be very important for you to understand pericardial axis because in this image, um, we've done complex overlays. The first, the left part of this panel actually shows a, a Berman angiographic catheter. Some of your labs may use it, others, may not, but this is a kind of a, what looks like a Swan-Gans catheter, but it's perfume, this injection ports are proximal to the balloon so that the jets come in a, across the axis of the catheter and the catheter is very stable in the ventricle. We like using that and what we've recorded here is the levo face uh, image of uh, the, the perfusion. So you can see the RV fills, it goes into the PA and you'll see the levo face. And on the right panel, you see the LAO view of the same image with an overlay of McAlpine slides, okay? So the, we'll spend a few seconds looking at the left. Panel, the contrast is going through, and this is the exact same patient. It was shot in biplane, okay? So this, this is RV, and you can see it's, I've just kept the his catheter um, uh, in the location to keep, you know, to reduce the crowding in the heart. Now, I'm going to overlay on the left image the line diagram of what you're looking at. And over here, what you see is um, the structure that you're looking at during a ventriculogram, all right? On the left panel, what is shaded in red is left ventricle, and all uh, that is shaded in with a blue outline um, is right ventricle, all right? So this is a huge amount of information, but I'll again revisit this one slide in future talks when you do catheter ablation of VT. Please sort of, uh, uh, we'll revisit this. This is not your only opportunity because um, the main point I want to bring to your attention here is in the RAO view, there are parts of the right ventricle that has border forming and the diaphragmatic surface of the ventricle. This area is extremely important for catheter ablation cases. And in fact, I am um, hope you can see my laser pointer over here. The part that I'm showing you over here, this becomes very important because this area is exposed to risk when you do a pericardial axis. And in the LAO view, again, when it plays, you'll see this. In the LAO view, what is to the right side of your screen is RV. And then what is border forming in the more leftward side of the screen is actually the left ventricle. 
And this area also roughly tells you where the PDA is going to run so that you can find your access point to the pericardial space in general to avoid coronary arteries, which are going to be running in this view, you know, sort of your foreshortened. Later, we'll come to, you know, the orientation between the membranes and muscular septae and when we talk about the intracardiac structures. But for the purposes of this first initial kickoff uh, talk, please keep track of the fact that what is border forming, all right? Now, having empowered with this knowledge, let's jump into access. So um, tomorrow you're going to be hearing uh, a dear friend of ours, uh, Dr. Calkins, talk about ARVC. And you'll see that, you know, epicardial ablation has had a huge impact in the world of VT ablation. And how do you get into the pericardial space? So this is all the structures in the chest wall, internal organs, and how do you access the heart? So access of the heart requires you to understand chest wall anatomy, knowing the fact that the heart is actually covered by the pleura and the lungs, and the access to it comes from a space uh, which is called the Larry space. So uh, here we go. So these are the structures that you have to sort of in the back of your mind file away. And when you take the heart and the uh, mediastinal structures out of the chest wall, this is how uh, it looks. This is a preparation from McAlpine where he has just uh, removed the heart and the lungs from the chest and he's displayed that. And you can see that uh, there's only a, a very finite portion of the heart, the anterior part, the retrosternal part, that is visible. Uh, uh, the rest of it is completely covered by the lungs and the mediastinal structures. Now, if you now look at it straight on and you cut the visceral rear of the pericardium, we're going to be revisiting this quite a bit. And where Dr. McAlpine has placed these little beads is the reflection of the parietal pericardium onto the great vessels, all right? Once you open that up, you actually can see all the structures of the heart. And this would be the equivalent of an AP view um, in, um, when you look at it you know, uh, in anatomy books and uh, chest x-rays. So AP view. So AP view really is not of great value for us in electrophysiology because it's not RAO, LAO, it's not attitudinal. And AP is perhaps the most, you know, <laughs> uh, inelegant view for cardiac interventions. I mean, look at this, the LAD cuts across here. This is RV, this is LV. It's like a mishmash. It's a little bit of everything type of a view. So now with that piece of information, uh, let's uh, briefly look at the cut edges of the pericardium over here near the superior vena cava, which is where my laser pointer is pointing to. And this is the aorta, this is the PA. This region, of course, uh, we're going to be talking about this in the future again, is going to be very important for laser extractions. And the dangers of what happens if you actually had an exit of the extraction tools, um, the location being you know, mediastinal versus intrapericardial bleeds. So this is a, um, the reflection of the pericardium become very important. So again, planting seeds for the future, uh, keeping, you know, keeping that in mind. So now let's use a, a, a very important resource and that is the Visible Human Project, which um, uh, is, the, uh, is a resource that's available. Uh, and this was done by the National Institutes of Health. And, and in this example, I'm trying to give you an orientation of how a needle can access the pericardial space. So this is the chest wall. And what you see over here is um, a cut that is being in the plane of the ch chest and the body. And we are slicing it step by step by step. Now you see the sternum is appearing. You can see the xiphoid process. The next cut, the sternum and the xiphoid has been removed and you can see parts of the RV are beginning to appear. And as you get deeper, you can see that now you see the diaphragm and the complex relationship between the liver and the pericardial space. And now you can actually see that, you know, what is shaded in blue over here is the pericardial space itself. So there's a thin layer and it immediately becomes obvious that 
the pericardial space is a uh, potential space, all right? So a, a quick look at that image tells you that there are lots of dangers of pericardial axis, and that is uh, you can get RV perforation, you can get pericardial bleeding. I just showed you the liver. You can damage the liver. You can get abdominal bleeding if you hit one of the blood vessels in the uh, diaphragm. And of course, you can enter the pleural space. Um, lots of dangers. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you avoid these dangers? Um, and what do we have? The tool that we have is um, over a century old. We just have to literally take a needle and enter the space. Um, there are new technologies that are coming up, but nothing that is yet widely used to make this procedure uh, stress-free. Um, but no matter what tools you have, you still have to understand anatomy. So uh, uh, when we talk about anatomy here, a quick uh, historical tip of the hat to Baron Larry, we call it the Larry space, which is the space with 